This week on Theater Talk. But it's, Oscar um, Wilde seemed to indicate that he felt he was born with this genius. Do you feel that? That you were born with your wit and genius? Oh. <laughs> it's like a pet. I <laughs> know. <laughs> oh, I feel I was born with it and misplaced it so early. <laughs> Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. is ever attractive except to his wife. And often I've been told not even to her. <laughs> that depends on the intellectual sympathies of the woman. Maturity can always be depended on. Oh. Ripeness can be trusted. <laughs> Young women are green. Uh, I spoke horticulturally. <laughs> My metaphor was drawn from fruits. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. There is a terrific new revival of The Importance of Being Earnest at the Roundabout Theater Company. It is a terrific excuse to talk about one of the great playwrights of all time, Oscar Wilde. And we are very, very happy to have with us tonight two Wilde experts. <laughs> Dana Ivey is in this uh, uh, critically acclaimed revival playing Miss Prism. And this is, I believe, Dana, what, your third... This is my fourth production Your of the fourth? play, but my second attempt at Miss Prism. Ah, and you, you played Gwendolyn? I played Gwendolyn when I was a much younger person, yes, mm -hmm. and I played Lady Bracknell. And now Miss Prism. Again. Congratulations on the reviews and the success of the Thank revival. Thank you very much. And we are also joined by someone you might call today's Oscar Wilde, Mr. Paul Rudnick, one of the funniest writers around. And you have a new collection out now, The Collected Plays of Paul Rudnick. I do. Welcome to Theater Talk. Thanks so much. Um, all right, Paul, uh, the influence of Oscar Wilde on your writing, has it been tremendous? Oh, incalculable. Uh, Oscar Wilde actually helped me get into college. Because <laughs> he, wrote, he wrote your recommendation. <laughs> everything, just about on the English <laughs> achievement test where you had to write an essay, and I don't remember what the exact demands were, but I wrote about how I considered the importance of being earnest to be a perfect play, which I do to this day, and certainly in this in Dana's production. And, it had, and I was, you know, a kid then, and it just floored me. And the fact, what was what's so extraordinary is when I went to see the current production, um, that I could tell that probably easily over half the audience had never seen the play before because they were so caught up in it. And the fact that here's a work that's well over 100 years old, and not only does it still play, it's still wildly funny. Mm -hmm. And that's almost impossible. But the mechanism is still so completely intact because you could feel the crowd's delight at the plot developments, at the character surprises, at the twists. Mm -hmm. And I thought, my God, that's what any writer aspires to, is, is that kind of gloss and that kind of longevity. That's re really interesting, Dana, having done the play now four times. We think of Wilde as the very witty one-liners, but the structure, oh, the structure is, is, incredible. Is, is terrific, too. I mean, yeah. it's a very, what we used to call a well-made play. Totally well-made. What is the, the trick, if you will, the secret, to playing wild and playing it well? I think a lot of it is just technical ability, mm. quite frankly. Mm -hmm. I think you have to have um, a terrific English accent because it's written with that sound. Right. And you have to have extraordinary enunciation and articulation and know how to be able to uh, heighten the right words mm. and do it uh, as seriously as possible. I mean, you have to give the language weight mm. because it's so clever. You can't just rattle through it mm -hmm. because um, it has to be laid out because it's so delicious. Yeah. As a writer, Paul, is, is there a, there's a rhythm to an Oscar Wilde play uh, that you, you pick up on and as she says, you can't just rattle through it, but you have to really sort of break down the lines, do you think? Oh, absolutely. I once saw a production of Ernest that was done in a completely naturalistic style, <laughs> as if it was conversational, and it was deadly. And it's one of those plays where, no, they're actually, you don't want to say there's only one way to do it, but on the other hand, it's you have to be very strict and you also can't just play style as if that were right. something that was, you know, a matter of, of holding a cocktail and being frivolous. Right. Because it's actually, I think, the what's the subtitle of the play is a, a serious play for frivolous, for frivolous trivial. people. For trivial. trivial people. For trivial people, yeah. And he, um, 
so that I think when you see actors who know what they're doing, actors of Dana's caliber, that you realize they there's a precision to it, mm -hmm. and there's a respect for it, and I don't even know if it's something that can be taught. I mean, you've worked with students. I'm not sure, I'm not sure either. I think on? you can, but you, you have to make sure that everybody who's doing it knows that each of the characters takes themselves very seriously. Mm -hmm. You never send yourself up, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we think of Oscar Wilde as sort of camp, yeah, yeah. and that means being totally aware of what you're saying and sending yourself up a little and bit. And winking at the audience. Yes, yeah. you cannot do this if it's going to really succeed. You have to take yourself very, very seriously. And that means that the stakes are very high. So that that's the way you play farce or high comedy in any case, is that you put, you invest it totally mm -hmm. and seriously and allow the language and the situation to be the comedy. Because even though we laugh at Lady Bracknell's um, social code, if you will, yeah. she believes it totally. wholeheartedly. Yes. And if it's violated, that is a crime against humanity. Exactly. Well, and that the pl everyone's lives are at stake, that uh, the, the two younger couples are falling in love and getting married and falling out of love, but their futures are at stake. Mm -hmm. And Miss Prism even has this lifelong um, arc that would be considered terribly tragic if it weren't a comedy. But so there really are things in the balance. And I think sometimes audiences are having such a good time they almost forget that, but that it it's ultimately, it's probably the greatest satire ever written on love and romance, mm -hmm. which are rather large topics. Yeah. And especially with the, the precision that Wilde managed. It's interesting to me, Paul, that you say it's one of the greatest satires of love and romance, and yet you read about the life of Oscar Wilde, and at the same time that he was sending it up, he was very so uh, associated with trying to live by this code, although he had an entirely secret homosexual life. He, he was so so concerned with going out to dinner and proper etiquette and proper manners. And in, a way he's, in a way, he's making fun, but in a way, it is the creed he lives by in that play. Well, it's a world he knew intimately. Ah. And there's, what's the line, the Lightly Bracknell line about society? Never speak disrespectfully of society, Algernon. <laughs> Only people who can't get into it do that. <laughs> and, and that's the key to so much of Wilde, but that he knew what he was talking about. He knew what the rules were, and, and so that he could later rather outrageously break them. But yeah, and you also get that sense of of glee in in sending it all up and and in in just observing how ludicrous the um, the rules of that society or any society are. But it's amazing how you don't. I don't never get the sense of an audience th sitting there thinking, "Oh, we'd never behave that way now. <laughs> this is so arcane. This is so antediluvian." You get the sense that no, no, no. Everyone has a parent. Everyone has been in love. You know that. So that there's this. There are, are universal rule laws at work. And is it in his life, I mean, is it his sexual identity, his homosexuality that put him outside of it all, do you, do you guys think? I don't know. I mean, I think that's... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Noted, Chris. Yeah, Jane. Um, <laughs> do with it what you will. Well, it's certainly what, it's certainly what was the made his tragic end right. uh, was being caught out and sent, you know, it, the laws were very strict back then. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, it certainly is the reason for his, the tragedy in his life, mm -hmm. his homosexuality. But going with the, the, what is it called, the sin that dare not... The love that dare not speak its name. The love that dare not speak its name. Um, that it was the undoing of his entire life, unfortunately. Yeah. And the irony of that, of course, is that he, if I'm not mistaken, he, he brought a lawsuit. Right against Lord Alfred's And that was the beginning father. of the end, yes. Yeah. No, it was 15 weeks after the opening of Importance of Being Earnest in the original production, Wilde was in jail. Uh -huh. And there were three trials, actually, that, that ensued. After um, Lord Alfred Douglas, who was, um, who was Wilde's lover, that when Lord Alfred's father... The Marquis of Queensbury. The Marquis of Queensbury, who had pursued Wilde relentlessly and insulted him in public and conspired to throw vegetables on the stage, and Wilde actually sued him for libel after there's... It, it's a complicated... But he sued him for libel for calling him something like a sodomite. A sodomite yeah. and hard, <laughs> insanely and, misspelled. And had to go time. lie in court yeah. to establish the libel case. But that was only the first of the trials. Then they became increasingly serious mm -hmm. after a while, yep. lost that original one, and it was the third trial that resulted in his, in his jail sentence and pretty much the destruction of his life. 
But I think, Michael, and with regards to your earlier question, I mean, there's a, a mechanism in the play called bunburying in which you have a different, you invent a cousin in the, in the country so that you can behave differently in each of your, your different social settings, which on one hand, I know a lot of the scholars delight to, to see that as a metaphor for um, Wilde's secret gay right. life. Yeah, yeah. But on the other hand, the social mask is, is far larger than that. I think everyone behaves differently practically with everyone in their life. You know, there's, there's the way you behave with your boss, the way you behave with your in-laws. I think so Wilde was getting at every variation on, on that mask. I love um, the picture of Dorian Gray. And you do get a sense, though, in that novel that this circle of this aesthetic crowd that Wilde was a part of and uses in the novel, that it is gay circles. But it emerges that a lot of these men in the novel, they're married. You know, they talk about going to see their wives, and I think Lord Henry's wife comes in. Mm -hmm. But you get a sense of it doesn't happen anymore because you can be openly gay, right. but a kind of secret aesthetic world mm -hmm. that he's a part of. Do you get that from your studies of him? Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yes, indeed. That there was a, there was on the face of it a, a conformity with what people expected. But underneath there was a very, uh, very exciting and uh, volatile sort of cult right. that was going on. So what was interesting was Wilde was part of every possible elite in terms of society, in terms of literature. Um, but he also, he made part of his early reputation and his early fortune even, touring America and lecturing, That's right. including yeah. out west, where yeah. he would, you know, lecture in saloons, and he was an enormous success. And sometimes he'd be more savaged by the kind of higher tone critics and more welcomed by the cowboys and the and the, uh, the gold mine peak crowd. So it was, he's a fascinating man because he really kind of, um, stepped into so many worlds. What was he lecturing about in America? Because it was, I, I believe it was... Before. The House Beautiful. That's right. Yes. Which was... The, he, he was talking about aesthetics. He was the leader, one of the leaders of the aesthetic movement. And he was talking, he'd written books, uh, pamphlets, articles, yep. and he was lecturing on the House Beautiful and how to have a beautiful life and how that was created health and harmony in your life. Hmm. Uh, to, so to, wait, to cowboys out west. Yeah, yeah. cowboys really out west. Extraordinary. To enormous <laughs> crowds. I mean, what, he was a big head. Fascinating. But when you when you say that he that the trial started 15 weeks after Ernest opened, that then you really you think well maybe the, there there was a segment of the elites who who so resented his satirizing them, and then at the same time were so threatened by this uh, homosexual scourge or whatever, however they saw it at the time, that they could gleefully go after him in the face of the success of this play. Oh, sure. I'm also, Wilde was, led such an, uh, a, a, a large-scale life he was and outraged yeah. so many people yeah. that so he did. He was so flamboyant. He was so flamboyant and so successful that he did become a target yeah. on, on every and possible level. And he quite level. clearly did not really take it seriously yeah. for no, he quite a long that. time. And he did things that if he had been a little bit more, you know, if he'd restrained himself a little bit more, he could have gotten away forever. But he really didn't take it seriously, the, the, the seriousness and the danger that he was getting himself into. I want to recommend to any Wild fans that they be sure to read De Profundis, the letter he wrote to his lover in jail, a lengthy essay, which really, where he co confronts what he believes he did. And it's a very, it's a serious and very profound work. Well, there's a wild industry now. Yeah. Also, I remember David Hare wrote a play called The Judas Kiss, which yes. where Liam Neeson, yes. Liam Neeson yes. played Yes, we call it Schindler's Broadway. Lisp. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do we, Michael? <laughs> no, we did at the time. Oh, we do, do we? Yes. The but joke. there was also Not just on this side that. of the table, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> But just Sorry. before that, there was the play Gross Indecency. Yeah. Yes, downtown. of course yeah. So he himself has now become the subject of a lot of other plays. I want to talk about the, the end of his life, though, because th th that's fascinating to me. Uh, have you guys been to Père Lachaise? Have you made the pilgrimage to the... I've, it's such a long time ago. To I the think. grave, though, yes. where he's buried. Yes. Have you... I have. I and, have. and the transvestite kisses oh, yeah. the grave there. Um, he really, for all all of his strength as a showbiz and a created character, that time in jail, those two years, completely broke him, did mm -hmm. they not? I mean, he was, he was finished when he got out. It well, put him into a reality that he had never ever thought about or con seen himself in, and it was shocking to him, I think. Well, and he also, he, there was two years of hard labor. Yeah. I mean, he was not in, in a white collar prison. Right. You know, so the, the, the physical toll it took on him. It was terrible for yeah. him. Yeah. It broke his, but it, 
at the same time when he was sitting there writing, I go back to this thing, he, he suddenly understood the, the role of people who are suffering, the role of the poor. It was the first time in his life that he hadn't written about only beautiful people count, only success counts, and that he really expresses a connection with more people don't have anything. by not having anything you can, in a, in a way, be richer than anyone. He, he really got to that place where he was expressing that. You're looking at me, Paul, with I such could. skepticism. I'm oh, trying no, to imagine Paul if he's I know, in that I place. No, there there certainly is a truth view, to that, but I think, a, I think it, it, it could be a mistake to create any kind of hopeful ending for a while. No, enough. but for a moment, he did get to a very deep place where he, he at least in his mind, made, made good of it. For those moments. Yes, maybe. although I also love that he remained Oscar Wilde because there is the story that when he was in this final rundown French hotel yeah, room yeah. that he looked up and said, and looked at the, the terrible wallpaper and said, either the wallpaper goes or I do, and then he died. <laughs> yeah. um, I so, mean, he was a true? broken man, but he was Oscar Wilde he to the end, wit, exactly. the end, forming the brilliant the funny lines. Man. Yeah. The thing is, when he went to jail, he was drinking a whole lot and drinking and smoking those opium cigarettes, and I think, which made him probably his judgment skewed his judgment that under the influence of his boyfriend he could do something so stupid as to sue the guy's father. He probably would have died of substance abuse. You know, they say, what would he have written? He right, was that's sick. true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. But that's not for broadcast. Right. Okay. <laughs> Well, what was it for then? <laughs> <laughs> because we're talking, and I'm Slamming saying that to Paul. Oscar Wilde, drug uh -huh. addict. No, no, I'm, but I'm saying that to Paul. You know, yeah. we, oh, he won't oh, no, let no, no, live. Okay. He probably yeah. wouldn't have lived. Yeah, but, but also he'd had sort of so many sections to his life before yeah. then, and and also he'd only started writing plays fairly recently yeah. in his earlier life, so that you never know what same what would have would have, yeah. would have yeah. followed. It's, it, well, Paul, when you're writing your witty plays and you're coming up with your witty lines, is there always Oscar Wilde to compare in the back of your mind? Do you ever think, uh, ooh, am I as good as... Oh, uh, you can't even try. It's so, <laughs> there is, the, the distance is so enormous that you, <laughs> you, just, you know, you, you, you can't even, if, you know, it's absurd. But it's, Oscar um, Wilde seemed to indicate that he felt he was born with this genius. That it was, and do you feel that? That you were born with your wit and genius, if I may say so. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a pet. <laughs> I know. I feel I was born with it and misplaced it so early. <laughs> Is that not an Oscar? That's an Oscar Wilde for the life. Do you see the influence of Wilde in popular culture today anywhere, Paul? Oh, everywhere. I think it's it's kind of twofold. There's the the wild legend and the wild culture hero, the sense of wild as a gay man brought low, but someone who is now so revered. So there's that, the, the, the tragic tale of Wilde's life sometimes can almost overshadow his genius uh, as a writer. And the, but then his influence in anyone from uh, Martin McDonough, from people who where you might not expect that. Yeah, how would you say that Martin McDonough? It's funny, when I was trying to think of real heirs to, to Oscar Wilde, Lieutenant Vinishmore is one of the most accomplished farces ever written, and it uses violence in a way in place of Wilde's language and, way, and Wilde's um, more restor wild restoration style comedy. But it pays off in very similar ways, and it's incredibly difficult to do, and it comes across as just effortless and enormously funny. But he's another, he, much like Wilde, he was uh, an Irishman who relocated to London. Mm -hmm. But he's somebody, it's, he's an heir also of Joe Orton, who can, is certainly a, a child of Wilde. Yeah. Um, but so, the, yeah, I think there are, are writers who've certainly learned many lessons also about the uses of comic absurdity mm -hmm. and, also, and comic discipline. Mm -hmm. And I think McDonough, who's, who's a genius in his own right, is very much in, in that mold, even though he's dealing with far lower class characters and seemingly more outrageous and brutal behavior. But yeah, that's that's where I see that legacy. If your playwriting career doesn't work out, I think you could be a critic, Paul. <laughs> um, <laughs> I never would, made that connection, but I think it's 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 well made. Yeah. One more one more point I think we should make is is not just that he was gay, making him an outsider, but we neglected to mention the importance of him being Irish. Yeah. Yes. Coming to England. And that may be even more of a profound influence on his able to look at English society with 
a little bit of healthy contempt. But then he did grow up in a very privileged household. His mother was a household. poet. Yeah. His mother was a very famous Irish poet. His father was a very well-known doctor who was knighted by the Queen mm -hmm. and founded St. Mark's Hospital in Dublin. They had dinner parties. His father was a talker. They, that's where he learned, Oscar Wilde learned to talk well because listening to his father command the dinner table. So he grew up in a quasi-English household, even though he was Irish. Yeah, yeah he was yeah. not in the oppressed underclass. No. <laughs> no, all, until he went to jail. <laughs> yeah. Although also, but the minute you decide to be a writer, you're suspect on a certain level. You're, yes. You know that. <laughs> I think that your hostess wonders what you will write after you go home. <laughs> so that there is, you know, there's an immediate a sort of slightly outlaw status yeah. to, to anyone in that situation. You've been in that uh, position before, Paul? Only someone would invite me to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a terrific production of uh, The Importance of Being Earnest at the Roundabout Theatre Company. Fabulous performance by the great, great Dana Ivey as Miss Prism. I would love to have seen your Lady Bracknell. I mean, yeah. Why don't you and Brian switch off? <laughs> Prism one oh, night, you although, Lady Bracknell one no, night. you know what I love? I believe that the same understudy covers Dana and Brian Bedford. Yes. Uh, and I thought that must be a first. <laughs> What's her name? Sandra Shipley. Ah. Ah, all right. <laughs> Dana, uh, Dana Ivey, thank you for being our guest tonight. Thank you very much. And Paul Rudnick, um, I think he's got a claim to being an heir to Oscar Wilde. Mm -hmm. Martin McDonough and Paul Rudnick. Mm -hmm. I, I certainly would like a part of the estate. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot for coming on tonight. Appreciate You're it. You're very welcome. The precept as well as the practice of the primitive church was distinctly against matrimony. That is obviously the reason why the primitive church has not lost it to the present day. <laughs> and you do not seem to realize, dear doctor, that by persistently remaining single, a man converts himself into a permanent public temptation. Men should be more careful. This very celibacy leads weaker vessels astray. <laughs> Andrew Andrew here at the press preview for Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. We're going to get a special sneak peek and look behind the scenes of this upcoming spectacular. I'm excited. What would you say to Sarah Palin to convince her to come see the show? Well, I would tell her about the, the big landscape of Australia, which is like Alaska. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a huge country, lots of hunting opportunities, you know, um, and uh, just about everybody carries a gun. There's some good country numbers in it. I think Sarah would just love those. <laughs> she might like the songs and that we have some pretty costumes that she would enjoy. Look, I think, I always say our secret weapon is that people come to the show not expecting to like it anyway because they think, oh, it's a jukebox musical and, oh, it's one of those film to stage transfers. And then we, we seduce them. Sarah. I know it seems like the show is about drag queens, cross-dressers. That actually is not the case. It's actually about family, family values, uh, people loving each other, taking care of each other, being there for each other. Everything that you and your, um, your people, your, your posse, a spouse. Good, wholesome family values. What would be your drag name? It's the name of the first dog you have, and the last name is the first street you ever lived on. That's what I believe, uh, that's what I was told. So, Bounce Woodlawn. Noddy Riversdale. <laughs> you asked. <laughs> Buddha Glacier was mine. B Buddha Glacier. Yeah. I would be Pedro McCauley. That's a good name. Pedro McCauley. Um, lots of lip syncing in the, uh, in the show. So if you, when you do karaoke, do you have one song you always do? I never do karaoke. But we don't all lip sync all night. It's only when we're playing our characters who, uh, when they're performing, when we're playing ourselves off stage, we sing in our own voices. Um, but uh, no, no, I would never be caught doing karaoke. I'm, I'm the one at home with the cup of tea in front of the telly. Neil Diamond. I do probably the best Neil Diamond impersonation you've heard. I'm waiting for the Neil Diamond musical because there's no way anyone will get the part other than me. And I say that with complete humility. Long serenade, and such were the plans I'd made. That's all you get. When you got divas who, ah, 
said, I just I just have one note. I'm the middle part, and that's it. So usually I just sing. This is so horrible. I just sing my audition songs. I know it's fake for practice. I know, but they're like, oh, you knew that song. Yeah, it's because that's, a, that's what I do. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'll sing um, Fame, and I just change Fame, and I just throw in my name, J. Elaine. Remember my name, Jaylene. I'm gonna something like that. Oh, that was I. That was the wrong key. I mean, you have them singing. Why did I do that? Why am I? I should have done it as a monologue. I'm gonna live forever. Ja- no, I. Yeah. We I always sing respect. I don't know why. <laughs> I think that I can be Aretha, but I can't. But I do my best. <laughs> what you want, <laughs> baby? I got it. Yes. <laughs> what you need, you know I've got it. <laughs> All I'm asking. <laughs> It's for a little respect when you Just get home. Hey, baby, baby, when you get home. Let's do it. Yes, mama. Sister. <laughs> That's it. Did I do, did I do all right? Come on now, go. Walk out the door. Just turn around now. Because you're not a welcome anymore. Weren't you the one who tried to hurt me? Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>